Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Must Read TV, the Skylark Bookshop virtual author series. My name is Alex George, and I'm the owner of Skylark Bookshop, which is an independent bookshop located in downtown Columbia, Missouri. This is a special early bird uh, edition of Must Read TV because our guest, uh, fellow Brit and author Catherine May, is in England, where it is 11 o'clock at night. And I'm very grateful to her for staying up probably past her bedtime, uh, to speak with us this evening. Uh, anyone who has been into the shop lately has probably heard me talking uh, about this book and knows how much I've been looking forward to this evening's conversation. Wintering was just chosen as the number one Indie Next list pick for December, the favorite book, in other words, of independent booksellers all across the country. And it is without question one of my favorite books of the year. It's also been praised to the heavens by Elizabeth Gilbert, NPR, The Guardian, and many, many more. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please do uh, post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and I will do my best to get to, to them towards the end of the conversation. And if you enjoy this evening's conversation, please, please do consider buying uh, a copy of Wintering. Here it is. Um, from uh, Skylark. You can order it now online. If you go to our e-commerce site, it's on the front page and you can just click on the on the pretty cover and it will take you to the relevant page. Uh, uh, or if you prefer, you can give us a call at 573-7776-990 or drop us a line at mail at skylarkbookshop.com and we will take care of you. Catherine is a writer of both fiction and nonfiction. Her journalism and essays have appeared in a range of publications, including The Times, uh, brackets London, close brackets, it says here, I suppose, as opposed to The Times, brackets New York, close brackets, uh, Good Housekeeping and Cosmopolitan. She lives by the sea in Whitstable, England, and is an avid lover of the outdoors. Catherine, welcome. It's lovely finally to meet you. Yeah, it's fantastic to meet you too. It's, I didn't, I wasn't expecting the British accent, I have to say. So I felt. Oh, they did oh, warn you. I didn't know. <laughs> no, this is wonderful. <laughs> well, and 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 I'm particularly thrilled because this is your, um, I guess your sort of your US tour debut this evening. Is. This is this yeah. is your first event that you've done. Opening yeah. night of the season. Opening night. Yeah. Well, well, excellent. Well, if this so is you're, this you're, is great. You've seen the debut of my special Christmas tree. Especially for the tour. Perfect, just perfect. <laughs> All right, so what I would love you to do just to begin would be if you could just read uh, a little bit from your book, uh, just to give everybody a, a, a flavor of, of what we're going to be talking about today. Sure, so this is a, a kind of intro to what wintering is. Everybody winters at one time or another. Some winter over and over again. Wintering is a season in the cold. It's a fallow period in life when you're cut off from the world, feeling rejected, sidelined, blocked from progress, or cast into the role of an outsider. Perhaps it results from an illness or a life event, such as a bereavement or the birth of a child. Perhaps it comes from a humiliation or failure. Perhaps you're in a period of transition and have temporarily fallen between two worlds. Some winterings creep upon us more slowly, accompanying the protracted death of a relationship the gradual ratcheting up of caring responsibilities as our parents age, the drip, drip, drip of lost confidence. Some are appallingly sudden, like discovering one day that your skills are considered obsolete, the company you worked for has gone bankrupt or your partner is in love with someone new. However it arrives, wintering is usually involuntary, lonely and deeply painful, yet it's also inevitable. That's a cheery start, I thought. I, <laughs> that would just make everyone feel really good. Everyone's just going, woo! Yeah. Well, but, but, it, <laughs> it, 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 but, but this is, this is a, I, I felt, a wonderfully um, uplifting book, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we, <laughs> as we go through. Um, so this, I mean, this book is a memoir, kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it tells the story of a particular time in, in your life that goes, I guess, from September through to the following March. Yeah. Um, in other words, it tracks the course uh, broadly of, of a winter. Mm. Uh, but you begin the book with a wonderful sentence which tells us up front that there's a lot more to one way of thinking about that word winter. And that first line is, some winters happen in the sun, mm. which I just love. 
Uh, and I wonder if you could begin by telling us a little bit about the genesis of this book mm. and where the idea came to you and how it is that winters can happen all year round. Yeah, so interestingly, I suppose, the memoir subject matter of this book was not what I planned for it. I had envisaged writing a book that connected together those dark periods of my own life and tried to kind of draw something out, draw some wisdom out of it really, and, and to make that connection for everyone else that there are these periods in life that we all go through, but which maybe we all conceal. And yeah, so I'd pitched the book and I was ready to write it. And then the, the stuff that happened in the book came after that. So um, my husband fell suddenly ill a couple of days before my 40th birthday while we were trying to celebrate on the beach in Folkestone. Um, and it was a real brush with mortality. He, he became very seriously ill very quickly, spent some time in hospital not really recovering. And then just as he was getting better, I became really ill instead. And I left my job and had all of those kind of concerns about how we'd survive, you know, the, the stuff that, that we all worry about sometimes. Um, and then just as we were getting on top of that, my son had to be pulled out of school because he had stopped coping. So we had this series of, of kind of catastrophes in the year that I guess made us all feel fragile but also took us out of the everyday world a bit. You know, we felt like outcasts. Um, there were different periods that we went through, but what was interesting, I think, in terms of writing the book was that these all seemed to kind of fall in, in my path as I was trying to write something else. I was trying to write from the sunny uplands and, and make this kind of survey of my life so far. And instead I ended up tracking them as I went along, which I think is probably why the book feels so intense sometimes. It's, you know, I'm actually walking through it at the time. So yeah, so it's, it wasn't quite as it was planned, to be honest. Right. That's often the way, I think, that you begin doing one thing and it ends up doing, ends up being something else. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's so interesting. Uh, and uh, I mean, what I've taken away from this book, and, I, and I've, I've read it twice, and I've begun to listen to it as well, um, uh, is just this idea about these, as you say, these fallow periods in our life. Mm -hmm. um, and you say, you know, they're, they're inevitable. Um, and so no matter how we would like to believe otherwise, life isn't a series of, of, sort of logical steps forward. Yeah. Uh, there are always... Um, uh, setbacks and sadnesses and you never know when they're going to come mm -hmm. and one of the things that the book has helped me think about is to accept that as just as a fact and the fact that you know these things will happen and and um they're, they're, and to, to to break away from the narrative that, that we're always moving forward because that just is, is isn't the case yeah. um and you know the message of the book i felt was that the you know, these, these setbacks, while they're difficult, they can also be instructive. Mm. Um, and perhaps even more important, they can be transformative. Um, and there's a lovely line uh, that, that you say, that that's the gift of winter. It's irresistible. Change will happen in its wake, whether we like it or not. And we can come out of it wearing a different coat. Mm. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and sort of how your coat uh, was different uh, when, when you emerged from your, your own uh, yeah. challenge? Yeah, I think, um, I think these periods of wintering, you know, they, they feel devastating, but what they also do often is open up space for us mm -hmm. to reconsider what's going on. And without that complete falling through the cracks experience, we often don't do the reflection that we need to, like change comes at us and we tend to resist it or to mm. try and kind of ignore it or push it back for as long as possible rather than engage with it. And when we enter these wintering periods, we are forced to make a reckoning with whatever it is that is being asked of us. And that's different every single time. And I think what emerges from that is a more profound sense of contact with being human, you know, like a, a deepened sense of empathy, a deepened wisdom, a deepened kind of 
engagement with the with actual life in a in actually very a sort of almost an evolutionary sense as opposed to the the gloss of modern day life we we're, we're forced to contemplate those really sticky topics like life and death and that is not always about welcome change even like i i know that if i were in full kind of self help mode what i'd be saying is like how actually your life will be better afterwards you just got to look for the signs like i don't i don't even think that's true about wintering i mean for me you know one of the things that emerged is you know i have a chronic illness now that i will not ever be cured of and will probably get worse and i will be interacting with doctors and hospitals over it and never eating like a normal person again mm. and that isn't a change that i could ever in all good humor and conscience like welcome like say oh well but that's for the best because no that would be a total lie but that change is coming at me anyway there's nothing i can do for that not to come so the invitation is for me to come to terms with that and to accept it and to live the best way i can and i think it's entirely possible to try not to do that and i guess that is the the wisdom of of wintering ultimately is that actually it's about acceptance of our complete lack of control over this life yeah there yeah, there's there's a bit um towards the end of the book i think you know where you got some very practical advice from your friend and I, is it daughty is that, i'm not sure how I, you, I think it's daughter yeah daughter how you pronounce it um and this was in the context of someone who had suffered from hypermania and depression. Um, and her doctor told her, you know, this isn't about getting fixed. This yeah. is about living the best life you can within the parameters that have been prescribed for you. Mm. Um, uh, and, and there was another line that you had, so you need to live a life that you can cope with, not the one that other people want. And, and I think, yes, that, and it is an incredibly hard thing to open your eyes to that, to the reality, no matter how unwanted it may be, and just to to um, work out, well, yeah, this is actually, there's no choice involved here. We just have to do it, and that 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 acceptance, and we'll talk about acceptance uh, in a, in a, in a little bit, is 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 such an important part of of everything that you're talking about. And you mentioned the gloss of um, of, of modern day life, and one of the other things that really struck me, uh, uh, which you wrote about, was about the sort of um, about Facebook and how everybody on Facebook is sort of relentlessly positive <laughs> mm. and and sort of going oh no you could like, if anybody ever dares write anything yeah. at all so I'm a bit sad today then there is this this tsunami of uh, sort of positive mm. stuff that sort of comes back at them. Um, and uh, you know, you describe it as endlessly cheering ourselves into positivity while erasing the dirty underside of life. Um, mm. And you talk about the sort of inherent deception in all of that, which, mm. which I think is so true. I mean, I've got, you know, with the various things that I do, so many different accounts, and 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 yes, the the, the instinct to always put your best face forward, and to say, yeah, this is my life. <laughs> sort of, well, yeah. actually, maybe not. Uh, was 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 really interesting and you know you say you say in the books well misery is not an option and we must carry on looking jolly for the sake <laughs> of the crowd which I, I thought <laughs> and so so a question that I have is like I mean how do, how do we do that how do we begin to ignore the crowd mm. it's really hard actually because it, what's really clear with our kind of current online culture and like to be to be clear, I love being online. Like I'm not one of these people that thinks it's really bad and that we should all avoid it. I think it's hugely positive for loads of people, but it's presentational, right? And mm -hmm. it's also based on good storytelling. Like the people who really float to the top in those environments are great storytellers. And the story of real life is actually quite depressing. And it, is, it doesn't have an arc, you know, like particularly if we're dealing with chronic problems or grief, which, you know, is one of those things that will just keep coming back at you in cycles for years and years and years or, uh, well, anything. I mean, like anything, it, it doesn't make a good story. And so we have a kind of choice 
to either engage with the storytelling that our audience who are actually you know they're supposed to be our friends but they've become an audience are demanding or to risk being kind of ostracized and I think I think we make the choice over and over again to have human contact and therefore to look cheerful and that's a that's a rational decision but it comes at enormous cost because it means that we often get this sense of shame about real life happening behind the scenes and that's a problem I think for me. I wonder, I wonder what it was like I mean I say this like I wasn't old enough to remember <laughs> life before Facebook really? of course I do but, <laughs> but it seems like so long ago but I mean there must have been a time when you know we didn't all present ourselves in this way and we just got on with things and 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 yeah, I'm sure many books have been written and many more will be written about the the sort of the the less than happy effects of social media and and, and what it means yeah. to us and our mental health. But okay, I mean, well, I think, that's, I think that's, we presented that's... ourselves, didn't we? I mean, I you know I remember my grandma putting a lot of effort into polishing her front step, for example. You know, she had like a brass plate along the front, and you know that was as far as anyone would have got. She'd have never let them in the house if they right. dropped around. But, you know, that's in a way, that's a similar thing. That's kind of implying that the inside of the house is more glamorous than it is. But, oh, yes. yeah, we, yes. we, are, we have become very surface, haven't we? And I think, you know, the, the kind of exact look of your house has become more important than ever before. The, having the right clothes, having the right brands, I th it's only accelerating without yeah. a doubt. And, I, guess, yeah. I guess it's a little, I mean, when you said, you know, we, we have to do this or we're going to lose our friends, a little bit of me went, oh, no, no, please not. But 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 I I, I understand that 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 that's uh, yeah okay. Well, let's move on to a, a, another question that I had, and we're going to talk in a bit about various um, techniques that that you talk about in the book uh, to address um, these these fallow periods in our lives. But before we do that, I wanted to ask you about a metaphor um, that you use, um, which is of a tree in winter. Mm. Um, which appears dead yeah. uh, to our ignorant, naked human <laughs> eyes, but actually is far from dead. And the, the buds are already there and they're sort of, everything is waiting. Uh, and the whole organism, in fact, is brimming with life. And you say uh, the, the, the tree is waiting, it has everything ready, and it is the life and soul of the wood, And which I just, which I loved. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that metaphor and how how the metaphor is instructive in mm -hmm. how we should think about our own wintering when it comes yeah i mean i like that the the idea that the tree is in bud in the middle of winter is something that i only learned when i was writing the book that had been invisible to me all my life and i yeah, you know I, I, no idea. I know it's funny isn't it and as soon as you know you see buds everywhere and also the fact that trees are in bud all through summer as well. The buds are hidden under the leaves. So now I go and check because I, you know, <laughs> I'm not very good at acts of faith. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually, when you look at the process by which a tree goes into winter, it's it's really fascinating. So the the leaves, when they lose their chlorophyll green, they reveal the colours that have always been there all along. Like they don't change colour in the winter. Those reds and oranges of autumn are always present in the leaf. We just can't see them until winter or until autumn. And then the process by which they change, I think, is really instructive for us, too, because they they form this thing called an abscission zone between the leaf and the and the branch. And that's basically a layer of cells that gradually hardens and hardens until there's a gap. And eventually the leaf then falls off. And as soon as the leaf falls off, the tree takes action to kind of heal itself to make sure that that's sealed off so that, you know, parasites can't get in and bacteria can't get in. And it seems to me that everything the tree does is actually pointed towards surviving winter rather than flourishing in summer. Like literally it's spending mm -hmm. summer collecting energy to get through the winter. And I, and that is then replicated across the natural world. Um, so I, I got to meet some very cute hibernating dormice when I was researching the book. Um, and, you know, they literally spend their brief waking months because they are asleep eight months of the year. The months that they are awake, they're getting fat to survive the winter. Mm -hmm. 
and bees, you know, all the honey we eat, like honey is literally what bees make to survive the winter. That is, that is what all of their effort goes to. And so actually nature has got winter in mind all the time. It's pointed towards winter. And it's only us who think that winter is this kind of irrelevant season that we have to ignore and kind of pretend isn't happening. Everything else is in the absolute kind of cut and thrust of survival in that time. Yeah. And I think we are too. We just kid ourselves. I think winter is the time when we are our most, in our most contact with the, the sort of beating heart of things. I, you know... I kind of love that about it actually, even, even when that means suffering, I think there's something very, very alive about knowing what that, what that feels like. Yeah, and, and you're right, it was so interesting how, as you said, you know, the, in, in the natural world, everything is focused on getting through this and, and, and humans are like the opposite uh, and it's all very counterintuitive for us and so I think that's one of the reasons why this book was was just felt like it hitting me over the head every other page because I, it was making me rethink uh, things um, all the time and it was just it was it was really you know and I love it when a book does that it's it's, it's, yeah. it's wonderful so so let's talk a little bit then about some of the specific things that you talk about in terms of how we how we can survive um, mm. how we can survive wintering and what and perhaps unsurprisingly I'm going to begin with uh, with reading, um, which is something that you talk about, <laughs> and um, you uh, talk specifically about I think it was Philip Pullman is that mm. is that is that right yeah and you 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 say um, I often turn to children's books at times like this when I'm yearning to escape into a world that is beautifully rendered and complex, yet soothingly familiar. Uh, and, and now as, as a bookshop owner, I obviously have a vested interest <laughs> in people reading across genres and ignoring spurious age restrictions that publishers tend to put on books. Um, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the appeal of children's literature mm. and particularly in the context of reading for comfort. Yeah, because I... I'm not much of a rereader except for with children's books oh, and I I don't just re I don't think I reread them just because they're cozy either I actually think that the issues that children's authors so often deal with are so big mm -hmm. and they're really about you know notions of becoming and how we've kind of learned to fully inhabit ourselves so I mean, Lyra in, in the Philip Pullman books is just one of my absolute favorite characters in literature. She's just, she's everything, Lyra, isn't she? <laughs> she just, she's, she's such a fierce survivor, but she also makes loads of mistakes. She screws up all the time and she has to find her courage in correcting what she's done wrong rather than necessarily fighting you know good and evil in a in a pure way she's she's incredibly complex i think and uh, you know like there's other uh, characters that i love along the same vein like um like will in uh, the dark is rising um you know he's another fantastic character who has to deal with much bigger forces than he can possibly contain himself but what I noticed as I sort of started to write down about all the books that I reread in winter is, is the significance of snow in those mm -hmm. children's books. Yeah. Like they, they so often have a snowfall in them. And what that seems to mean is that it, the adults get incapacitated by the snow. And so it creates this blank slate in which children can lead and which, in which they can start to kind of project a new identity and I, yeah, so I looked at a load of books that did that in the, you know, so I looked at um, the Narnia books, which obviously sure. is such a, a sort of famous example. Yeah. Um, the Box of Delights, which, um, which I know so well from the TV, the BBC TV series that was on when I was a child, I think in about 1985. Um, again, like a snowfall just transforms the landscape and allows ancient magic to start acting. Um, and my my absolute favourite, which is the Children of Green No, um, which again was a as a, it was a TV series when I was a kid, and I turned to the book after the TV series. Um, but that's I don't think it's well all that well known really, but it's the most wonderful ghost story. Okay, yeah, I've not heard of that one. Um, 
oh, you must have a read of that. Lucy M. Boston. Okay. It's, a, it's kind of a, um, is it interwar or just post Second World War? But it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful story about a little boy who goes back to visit his grandmother at Christmas in his family ancestral home, which is a great big kind of rambling pile. Uh, and he meets all the, he's a very lonely child and he meets all the ghost children that live in the, in the house um, and suddenly isn't lonely. But it's, it's incredibly beautiful and, and sort of carefully, carefully written to, uh, it reflects much bigger things than, than any children's book would be expected to reflect, I think. Well, I, that's one of, I mean, we have a campaign at Skylark. You know, we, we always want people to read children's literature and YA and um, anybody who sort of wrinkles their nose and said well I don't think that's quite for me we said well have you tried it you know because there are, there are, there are treasures uh, oh there yeah. to be to be enjoyed um, mm -hmm. so uh, those are all wonderful recommendations thank you um, Actually, you know what one sorry I'm gonna yeah, like yeah. while we're on this subject one of my absolute favorite books this year which I don't know if it's even come out in the states is called The Super Miraculous Journey of Freddie Yates have you come across it? Uh, I haven't. Um, I'm just looking at. Is it? Is it oh, it's actually, somebody who's just asked, Julie Humans, has said, "Could you repeat the title and author of the ghost story?" Oh, that's who's the children of Green No. Um, so No is K N O W E, uh, and it's by Lucy M. Boston. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't heard of that. Um, oh, I tend to. Fantastic. Um, can we tell, tell us the, the, the name again, the title? Uh, the Super Miraculous Journey of Freddie Yates, um, mm. which is, I'm trying to think of the name of the author, but it was a debut, a, a wonderful debut children's book, middle grade, um, and it should become a Richard Curtis film. It's just perfect. It's so funny. The characters are wonderful. And I totally read it for pleasure myself and then read it to my son who loved it too. It's wonderful. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. That's, uh, that's <laughs> Top awesome. tip. on the lookout for, but let's hope it, hope it gets over here. Um, so there, there's a saying, and I, this is one of the things, and you, you'll have noticed by now, I've, I'm reading a huge chunks of your book back at you. I hope that's okay, <laughs> but it just, it just tells you how much I adored it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you um, you talked about, you know, there's a saying about how you should dance like nobody's watching. And you say, well, I think you should read like nobody's watching, which, <laughs> which, um, which I, I, I adored. You, you talked about reveling in the play of my own absorption. Um, and when I read that, it was like this great big bell rung in my head. And I thought, oh, yes. Um, and people get very hung up about reading. This is rather going back to what we were just talking mm -hmm. about. And, um, you know, we have another rule uh, at Skylark, which is nobody is allowed to use the expression guilty pleasure. You know, people oh, sometimes yeah. come in and they say, oh, well, I really like pick your author and say, but it's, like, it's my guilty pleasure. And we just say, you're not allowed to do that. It's, it can just be a pleasure. Yes. There's no guilt uh, attached to it. Um, and I was just wondering when, you know, thinking about <laughs> reading like no one's watching, whether, whether you have developed, um, a sort of grand theory of, of reading. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, because I'd love to hear it if you have. I Do you know what? I think I'm quite an idiosyncratic reader. I really, I don't pay that much attention to what's been published recently. I let that filter down through to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I read thematically. I mean, part of it is because I'm always researching a book in the back of my mind somewhere, but I will often chase down an idea through loads and loads of books so this year I've been chasing every reference I can find to this uh, meteor storm in 1833 the um this incredible kind of meteor storm that was witnessed across the east coast of America and I followed it I've spent ages following it through because actually it kind of crops up in uh, Native American culture it became mm -hmm. really important to African Americans because, because it became this kind of point of genealogical reference when they were researching their uh, their sort of slave ancestors who often used like use that as a as a point in time in their storytelling um, it's just absolutely fascinating and that's how I love to read I'm always in the index I mm -hmm. rarely read the whole of a book which I know is an absolutely terrible thing to admit I routinely <laughs> jettison books that I can't be bothered to finish I'm I'm actually quite appalling you shouldn't ask me really <laughs> so no so that's an interesting thing because because I 
I 99% of the time will finish a book if I've begun mm -hmm. it, even if I don't enjoy it. And it's partly, I think, um, some weird karmic thing. Um, as well, people writer. finish your book. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The idea that somebody would, would throw my book, which I know they do all the time, but across the room, I'd, I'd prefer they didn't. So, so I always try and sort of finish a book if I if I can. But mm. every so often I won't. But it, it's it, I'm so jealous of you because it sounds very it's a liberating idea that you can just get fifty pages in and go. Oh, you know, I don't like this very much. This, yeah, let's just move on. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean indexes, indices, indexes are just a, a marvelous things and just the idea I was just this this morning I was looking at because something I'm researching so so it doesn't matter what I'm doing I'm I'm curious though this this meteor thing is that is that for a book that you're, you're yeah it's for, my, okay. it's for my next book um but it's also I've read I, I realized that I was reading well past what I need for the book I just I right. just love because then then that kind of brings you into contact with other ideas it just randomizes your reading in a funny sort of a way and it randomizes who you read too mm. But yeah, I'm, I, you see, I, uh, for a long time, I've worked as a reader for a literary scout. And so in my professional life, I have to finish every single book and I have to then write a blurb of that book, uh, you know, that really accurately reflects exactly what's happened. And so I think in a way that liberates me because I can say, oh, well, I'm finishing some books. That's fine. <laughs> and, you know, they are rewarding, obviously, but I'm always in pursuit of something and finishing books just slows me down. But I'm I'm also a big nonfiction reader. So maybe I'm more likely to finish a fiction book, but I'm, I'm still pretty guilt free about thinking, oh no, this just isn't for me. That'll do, thanks very much, bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think there's any danger of anyone not finishing your book. Uh, Cause it's-, it's, cause it's I'm okay it's with it if they don't. I mean, I- like if people get all they need out of the first chapter, then I'm like, I don't feel bad about that at all, really. Right. That's fine. Right. My goodness, it's just that's the most zen thing I've ever heard in all this. <laughs> <laughs> it was well, none of my business as well, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so so that that's true. The, the, ne the next thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, was prayer or mm. something akin to prayer. Um, and you talk about, uh, I hope I can call it a practice um, uh, of, which sort of seems to me like a kind of a meditation mm -hmm. um, and you call it a profoundly non-verbal experience, uh, mm -hmm. an untangling. And you use this wonderful expression, praying earthwise. Yes, uh, it takes you to, to a place beyond words. And it actually put me in mind of a, a Mary Oliver poem mm -hmm. called, Called praying, and if you don't mind, I'm just—it's very short. I'm just going to read yes, it, lovely, because it's an, an apologies to my poor poetry reading <laughs> skills. But here we go. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, and then patch a few words together. And don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and into a silence in which another voice may speak. Mm, it's lovely, isn't it? It's lovely. And I just, so when I was reading your, your description of, uh, uh, where's it gone? Praying Earthwise. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that immediately occurred to me. Yeah. Um, and yeah. this, this, um, this, in particular, the, the, the doorway into thanks mm -hmm. um, and how that kind of, I mean, I would call it contemplation can open us up and help us see see things that we might otherwise miss and how we are able to sort of hear that other voice and did you do you know that poem have you heard that before funnily enough I read it this year for the first time after I'd written the book yeah I came across it I one of my little obsessions is Mary Oliver's use of the word attention because it crops up across all of her work and I love the way she writes about attention I think it's mindfulness, really. And I, it, it's so, it's such a beautiful word when she uses it. It's just that she, uh, there was a lovely um, interview with her on the Krista Tippett podcast on being recently. And she talked about attention then. And I, it's just one of those words that becomes transformed when she uses it specifically. There's Mary Oliver's attention is different to everybody else's attention, I think. Yeah. <laughs> That book of essays, um, 
which I know is just behind me somewhere, or maybe it's downstairs, but she wrote this wonderful book of essays that whose name is, is escaping me. Um, is and upstream? It's, yes, thank you, yeah. upstream. Uh, and it's all about that. And it, and it's and you're right, mm -hmm. it's about that mindfulness. And um, and yeah. I mean, it struck me that that's kind of what, I mean, correct me if I remember, but that, that's, that's the practice that you're doing, right? Absolutely, you're, yeah. You're just, paying attention yeah, to yeah. what is around you uh mm. yeah so and you you also wrote what i think is the best sentence that that i have read this year Ooh, what um, was that well i'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, know. I'm, about, I'm about to read it to you so you can talk about it so talking about how you pray you said it is nothing that i have to advertise or discuss and so i'm able to be discreet about it disingenuously hanging with the rationalists while I furtively seek the numinous, <laughs> which I don't know, I just I just adored that, um, and I recognise that caution um, that you and I, maybe it's an English thing. I, don't, I, don't I was about know. to say, I wonder if that's quite a British thing actually. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about Englishness in a, in a little bit, but but there's that like, there's this because it feels to me, and forgive me if I'm sort of uh, projecting too much, but there was a sort of slight bewilderment in the, what you call the the urge towards ritual. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, mm. about, about that. Yeah, I was I was brought up without any ritual at all, actually. Yeah. Uh, like my mother is, you know, very self-consciously atheistic. Um, and, you know, like to the extent that no one in my family has middle names, because my, my family consider that a bit fancy, you know, like that's, that's getting above yourself to have a middle name. <laughs> that would be too rich, it's too much ritual for them. And so I, and actually I would say I married somebody who's just the same as that. And I have always craved ritual in my life. I used to like go to brownies so that I could go to church on Sunday because I love it. I love the whole thing that everyone gets up and sings and sits down again and reads a little bit and we have a think about some stuff. That's so up my street. But I struggle with belief, you know, I struggle with actual, you know, believing in anything that is not evident in front of me that I can't prove and I also struggle with authority too like I am so suspicious of anyone vaguely messianic I, I can't go along with it and so yeah I I think I've let ritual kind of slip into my life by the back door and I do feel furtive about it actually I, I do feel like I have to do it quietly and on my own and like by writing about it, I've massively externalized it. And now everybody thinks I'm this great kind of ritual builder. And that makes me want to hide under a rock, frankly, because I'm not very, not very overt about it. But, you know, I, a, attention for me is a ritual, like deliberately sinking into attention and noticing change. Like that's, that has been such an important component of my life over the last few years is really, noticing what phase the moon's in, noticing when the sun's rising and setting, noticing what flowers are out, you know, it, it's tiny, but it is so significant and so helpful in, in like processing the passing of time, I think. Um, and, and also you letting yourself pin significance to things that are otherwise insignificant. Um, that's a very Mary Oliver sentiment, I think, I, you know. <laughs> Where we are in full all over the world here. Oh, at this time, I love that. What better place to be? Um, <sighs> yeah, that's, that's so interesting when you talk about noticing change, because I was going to ask you about one of the things that you talk about is darkness mm. and how we, you know, I've got lights on everywhere <laughs> and um, mainly so people can see me, I suppose. But, but you know, we, we, we um, with the technology in the world that we live in now, uh, it's it's a little harder. We become inoculated against the change of the the, the shortening of the days and the change of the seasons. Um, uh, and I guess so. Here we're talking about a literal winter uh, as yeah. opposed to the, the metaphorical one. But it is it, it becomes easier and easier as as you know we have houses that well maybe not in England but you know, people are always surprised when I tell them that houses in England don't have air conditioning. They go, How do you survive? We go, well, it's just not hot enough. But it would be so fancy to have air conditioning. Oh, I know. I know. You know so, what? Over the summer, my next door neighbour installed air conditioning in her conservatory, and we were gossiping about it for weeks. We're like, oh my god, who does she think she is? 
just open a window like the rest of us. Well, and and in Missouri, it's it's insanely humid and yeah, I mean, really you need it, quite you? nasty in Missouri. And so you, the last thing you'd want to do is to open a window. So anyway, everything is climate controlled. We find these ways of actually pushing out the uh, yeah. the elements, and so that we we just don't get to. Um, even really notice them at all we sort of yeah. um we, we don't even have, we get everyone here has garages attached to the house so you don't mm. even find mm. out how cold it is um uh, and, but i was thinking particularly about darkness and and how how we miss that how we can miss it um particularly since our clocks just went back uh, and, and so, so you have full back yeah. string forward yeah uh, finally <laughs> finally we learned that um uh and and I love that. So, so you wrote you wrote, wrote in the book about waking up early, um, mm. which is something that I also do. Uh, and um, and you you talk about sort of going downstairs um, and then doing this really interesting thing that I which I loved, which was like you have a lamp mm. uh, on one side of your desk. Tell me if I'm getting this right. And then on the <laughs> other side you have a candle. Yeah. Uh, and so you have a flickering light over here, <laughs> and a, and a light over here that. Yeah. Is, is solid and doesn't move uh, and then you say sort of you sort of like to work between the two mm. um, uh, and you like that sort of liminal space which is slightly mm. uncertain and you're not quite sure um, and, you, and you say um, a certainty is a dead space in which there's no more room to grow and so this this way that you have of sort of having this flickering light and this real light is, is a way of sort of creating that that sort of uncertain space mm -hmm. in the middle um and and i was really curious way how, how how did you come up with that idea was that it was it was just so interesting to me i think in a way it's practical i mean i when i get up in the night so i you know this based on the idea of the watch this this kind of historical fact that people used to get up in the middle of the night and and have this kind of space in the middle of a winter night because they couldn't sleep out the whole time um and I, when I do get up like that, I try and keep the house as dark as possible. I try not to come into contact with artificial light. Um, and so really, I guess it comes from me just minimizing the light that I'm encountering. So I have a very dim light uh, lamp on and I love to light a candle when I get up anyway, because that feels organic. And, and again, candles are about the passing of time. You know, you can notice how much they're burning down. And it's just very beautiful light, it's very gentle light. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I realized that I was writing between the two, that that was, that was where I was tending to be, just somewhere between the two. And I, yeah, there's, that's another ritual, isn't it? It's just mm -hmm. another, it's a definite ritual. I don't need to light a candle when I get up in the night, you know, there's no necessity for that, but I always do because I want to create that, that liminal space I want to deliberately create a space that feels peculiar to that time of night that doesn't feel like day that doesn't even feel like the morning you know it is it's very much the middle of the night and I will go back to bed after that and sleep you know for another few hours before I then do the morning which is a, a whole different thing yeah right yeah I mean so much of this book seems to, to tell the story of a struggle to find that that uncertainty mm -hmm. Um, and to make yourself stay there and actually deliberately making yourself a little bit uncomfortable yeah. um, in the service of finding new truths. And, you know, and one thing we haven't talked about are these, these wonderful episodes in the book where you, you go on these, uh, these adventures. <laughs> Jaunts. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, and whether that's to Iceland or to Stonehenge, which is actually very close to where my parents live. Oh, really? Oh, lovely. Yeah, they're, they're, they're in Wiltshire. Um, or going to this wonderfully wonderful sounding Swedish church service in mm. London um, and, and you so you put yourself in these situations and I, I got the sense that you were in doing that you were maybe not trying to but get, get out of a rut but you were looking for something mm. um, and, and I wonder and, and maybe it's a different like a less conventional way of looking at things yeah. I wonder if if, did, did that work? Um. <laughs> yeah, it did actually. I, I mean, I've always been quite method about writing. I think like quite often I'm just trying to do things that are interesting and I, I reject loads of them as not very interesting experiences. So the, the ones that make the cut are the, only the ones that have interested me. But 
actually, yeah, I was looking for, as, as you say, that a space that I could fully enact my, my thought process, I guess. Um, and, you know, like the Swedish church, you know, for uh, St. Lucy's Day, um, which is the, you know, the famous service where the girls walk along with the candles in their hair. It's coming up, actually, it's the 9th of December, I think, St. Lucy's Day. So there should be a few services coming up all around the world. That was, a, you know, that was almost, almost familiar to me. It almost felt like an English church service, except that it was in Swedish. Um, and they they actually began the service in English because of all the children there and then then broke into Swedish. And yeah, I I kind of I almost like being a slight outsider in these things as well. I'm I once I feel like an insider, I, I tend to lose interest in experiences. So that was very true of going to see Midwinter at Stonehenge as well. I was an outlier there, you know, like there was so but but it was so diverse that it really didn't matter there were all sorts of beliefs there converging on Stonehenge for the for the rising of the sun the day after the shortest day which incidentally isn't what it would have been in fact the original worship would have been the setting of the sun because that lines up with one of the trilithons yeah. but but that trilithon has fallen down so it doesn't matter anymore so we do the sunrise instead um have you did you ever, ever go for midwinter no, no, I never do. It's one of those things like the closer you are, the less likely you are. <laughs> to it. so yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. There is, there is, but we, my, my parents live in Marlborough, which is just down the A4 from Avebury. Right, yeah. Avebury is also very well known, not as well known as Stonehenge, yeah. but a lot of these, these rings of stones. And now when we go back to England, my, my kids always, they always want to go and walk through the stones. And, <laughs> Uh, so, so we we have our own little bit of sort of yeah, wacky yeah. English mysticism, but <laughs> but, <it's, laughs> but you can actually still walk through them. Of course, Stonehenge is all now has been yeah. sort of national trust stuff, and it's sort of, uh, oh my uh, goodness! Uh, Except for midwinter, that's the thing. Right, so they took the fence down. Um, and that's I mean that was one of the big reasons I wanted to go. I just wanted to I wanted to get up close and and see them. And you know, like my dad had said when he was a kid, they used to just wander in. It was no big deal. It's all you know it's all changed um things have changed yeah and rightly so yeah i understand right. that you need to preserve these things but yeah well there, there's we... in my book that says that the victorians used to give tourists a hammer and chisel to chip yeah. off their souvenir <laughs> yeah, that was unbelievable yeah, yeah no i have memories of running up and down there's a place called silbury hill which is i think an old burial mound and we used to run up and down it when i was you know five or six and now of course you can't go there <laughs> you absolutely can't no, no, no way so i also wanted to and i'm conscious of the fact we've got some questions but i i've not finished asking mine yet so um, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more thing which is about song mm -hmm. um and one of my favorite parts of the book was towards the end when you talk about the robin and you talked earlier about how animals spend the summer getting fat so they can sort of survive the winter and um you talk about the robin who sings throughout the winter mm. you know um uh, even if there aren't any lady robins around who are yet going to be interested in him um but he doesn't care because he sings anyway um mm. uh, just because he can and uh, and you say so he is in practice for happier times and um it seems to me that one of the wisest pieces of advice in this book is really very specific and it's just this just sing sing uh, and you say we sing because we must and actually i wonder i'm if you could if you would mind just reading sure. that passage it's i think it's on in in the galley it's on page 228 if it's the uh, same page it is the same yeah and if you could just read from where it says we sing because we must just to the end of that page okay. uh, i just think i'd love everyone to hear this because it's so wonderful we sing because we must we sing because it fills our lungs with nourishing air and lets our hearts soar with the notes we let out. We sing because it allows us to speak of love and loss, delight and desire, all encoded in lyrics that let us pretend that those feelings are not quite ours. In song, we have permission to rehearse all our heartbreaks, all our lusts. In song, we can console our children while they're still too young to judge our rusty voices and we can find shortcuts to ecstasy while performing the mundane duty of a daily shower or scrubbing down the kitchen after yet another me meal. Best of all, we can sing together, whole families knowing the same songs and giving them the same meaning. When I sing with my mother, 
I'm struck every time that our voices are the same. There's a moment of deep genetic resonance in hitting the exact same note in the exact same way. When I sing with my husband, our voices clash, but we sing the songs that mean something only to us, most often the yearning tones of Wichita linemen. When I sing with my son, I'm teaching him something, not just words and lyrics, but how to survive. Like the robin, we sometimes sing to show how strong we are, and sometimes we sing in hope of better times. We sing either way. I never read that bit, that's lovely. I'll Thank do you. that one again. That's quite a nice one to read. You've got to read it. Yeah, I'll it's do that again. That's a nice one. <laughs> Shortcut to ecstasy. I mean, I just, I mean, my my daughter is a singer and she's got a beautiful, beautiful voice and I'm very mm. jealous of it. But it's just, I just read that and just thought, oh boy. <laughs> well, well, I've got, I have a ton more questions. I wanted to talk to you about Under Milk Wood as well, um, but we haven't really got time. But um, and, but that whole, the whole, Welsh lilting, slow Not way. Welsh vowels. Yeah, and, uh -huh. and, and, and how, I, well, what, I'm going to ask you one question because um, about <laughs> it, sort of related to the, 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 the slowness of speech and how you can relish it. Uh, and as I was reading through the questions that I had, I had another question, but I'm going to ask you this one instead, <laughs> which is, um, which is to cut me, which is, do you, when you write, because a lot of people I know, um, uh, write longhand mm. uh, and I'm wondering whether speaking with a Welsh accent and being <laughs> slow is a bit like writing with a pen uh, or with a pencil because it slows everything down yeah yeah, yeah and you, I'm like I'm longhand. an actual gabbler so <laughs> it it it's a it was a really interesting process reading Under Milk Wood aloud and in a not quite a Welsh accent but in a Welsh <laughs> way. I, I'm not very good at accents. Um, good news is a, nobody nobody here knows if that was a good Welsh accent or a bad Welsh accent. Know, we can get away with anything. You could do Yorkshire and they wouldn't know. It would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did. It. I mean, it it changes the meaning of the story completely. Actually, I. You know, under Milk Wood, I'd always seen as quite impenetrable and quite, you know, almost gibberish, but not quite. Mm. But when you start to read it in that very Welsh way and to find those rhythms clip clopping across the cobbles, you it, it, it rings the meaning out of it in a completely different way. And it changed the way I used my voice as well. It really did teach me to pace the way I talk much better. My voice is a very different thing Absolutely. to what it was before. So I've learned to kind of sing and talk at the same time, but I was already a singer, but I was destroying my voice. Right. Um, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, I think honestly, Philip, the, the singing teacher was a genius for stopping me from singing and starting me just reading. Yeah, that's so what interesting. Uh, and just to, just if you if you've not listened to it, there's a wonderful album by Stan Tracy mm -hmm. uh, called Under Milk Wood, and it's uh, there. There are two versions of it. There's one which is his jazz quartet, but there's one where they actually have somebody reading the reading the words behind the music or in front of the music. And so Ooh. you should you should check it out. There's I must no, listen there's, to there, there's a song called Starless and Bible Black, which is. <sighs> Beautiful. Anyway, let's get to some questions. Um, I can't hog you all the time, I'm afraid. So the, the first one is from Mary, uh, who is actually a bookseller at Skylark and who um, I think wanted to interview you too. So sorry, Mary. Sorry, Mary. Um, uh, and this, uh, I'm just going to read this to you. So first off, I actually got teary seeing you on my screen. Your book is just completely moving and marvellous. You wrote that you were not able to do all of the winter research that you would have liked. Where else would you like to travel to research? I want to go to Svalbard very, very badly. I have always wanted to go to Svalbard. I, I mean, it just... A part of it is just my insane idea of North being a, a good thing, whatever, however it, it kind of goes. I love the idea of pushing that to its furthest extent and finding that really wild North. So, so where, where is that exactly? So Svalbard is an island off, well, far off the north coast of Norway and just below the Arctic. So there are polar bears there, there are icebergs. Um, you see narwhal in the sea and things like that. It's complete winter magic, but it's also very 
you know, barren and difficult to live in and very expensive to get to. <laughs> And I I wanted so badly to go there to research the book, but there was just no way it was going to happen. <laughs> but yeah, I still I still dream of going to Svalbard. Um, you've just reminded me, and I know it's funny I hadn't thought of this before. Um, earlier on in this series, we had a writer, one of, he's a very good friend of mine called Peter Guy. Um, and I don't know whether you've seen his book. You might have, because his second novel is called Wintering. Oh, really? Oh, no, I've not come across that one. There's a, quite a few books called Wintering, actually. Oh, oh. So, so that's, and his last book is called Northernmost. And that was the book that we talked about a few months ago. And it's set in in Norway uh, and also um, in the on the, in the North Pole. And all of the sort of frozen tundra, I think you would enjoy it. It's, uh, it's, a, yeah. it's a beautiful book. So What's, um, what's, yes, and... what's kind of invisible as well is that the editor of this book used to be the poet in residence in the Antarctic too. So she brought this, this absolute kind of winter sensibility to it as well. This, this innate wow. understanding of, you know, and love of, of the kind of clear air of the, the intense cold. So yeah, How it, we're a tribe, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, talk about an editor, a book finding its editor. That's absolutely extraordinary. In so many ways, honestly, she's amazing, yeah. That's great. All right, so then Christina has a question. What is your insight on juggling self-care and balancing parenthood? Oh, wow, gosh, Christina, maybe you could tell me. Um, I think <laughs> it's really hard. And and you know what? I think we talk about this like it's a like it's a solvable problem you know like there is a that there is a balance to be found because actually the truth is that we have to keep throwing ourselves onto our children's care it's vital that we do that is our job and there's no circumventing that but you do have to maintain a notion of what's vitally important to you and be willing to give up the things that aren't so important to keep that core of of things that you value and like writers are probably the most selfish people <laughs> most selfish parents there are when it comes to <sighs> making those compromises because actually you know I will do a lot for my son but I will not stop writing I, I need my time um and I yeah so I think it's about really judging what's important but also I've given up other things that are peripheral really like I don't watch tv anymore really um, because I haven't got enough time to do everything. I love TV, just uh, to be completely clear. Like, this, like when I tell people I don't watch TV, they think I've, you know, it's some kind of big ethical mission. <laughs> that is not the case. That is really not the case. And I particularly like really trashy TV. Like I only watch funny things. I don't watch serious drama because they just, I can't sleep afterwards. Um, but I, you know, like I've, I've given a lot of that up. Um, and so I think that self-care is about is often about pairing back what you may what you think you should have to get right down to what you need. And then I guess one day we'll flourish outwards again too. But I I find parenting a very wintry experience, I have to say. And that's with all adoration, you know, in place. But there are a lot of sacrifices and a lot of unavoidable ones, I think. Yeah. And I, I mean, I agree. I've got two kids and you know, my kids are 19 and 15 now. So they're a little mm. older than, than, than your son. But it's um, and, and you going back to what we were saying before about how the, the outward facing uh, what mm. we present to the world. And, you know, so often you're just when people say, so how is it? And the idea that you might go, it's a bit crap actually right now. It's not yeah. great. You know, and it's like, that's like, you can't do that. It's like, no, you have to, being a parent is always 100% fantastic all of the time. And, and this is the myth that we have to present and, 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 and it's tough. And I think that mm. puts so much pressure on people. Um, if you can't actually admit that sometimes it's actually not that fun. And no, loads of it's not that fun. And, you know, there's a lot of, sitting next to them while they watch terrible tv shows because they won't let you leave and uh, yeah there's a lot yeah. of like remaking meals that they've refused to eat resentfully you know there's tons of that rubbish honestly yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah i think sometimes it's about playing a long game isn't it yeah and 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 it's, it's it is interesting i mean was it was Cyril connolly wasn't it who said that the 
was it the the pram in the oh, hallway the hall. yeah the enemy, enemy of promise. Of promise. yeah i think it's a lot of rubbish i mean i just you know you but, but you have to make the time you have to be more disciplined and as you say you have to make decisions and you can't do everything so it's a question of prioritizing and um, um yeah and not like you don't have to over indulge in that culture that comes around children like I, you know where we live in whitstable beautiful town people come here having moved down from london to make a family mm -hmm. and that can get very um competitive you know? <laughs> like everyone wants to run the most perfect children's parties and do the most perfect activities and, and I, I just you know if I did that I wouldn't have time to do much more interesting things you know my my son has to suck it up a little bit sometimes but my, my son was born when we, lived, when we lived in Islington and it was a oh. bit like that there so yeah was... yeah yeah well they they moved to Whitstable when they want a garden <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, you probably know half the people who are my yeah, neighbours. Almost so. certainly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I got one last question from Peggy. Um, I have been trying to tell my story through personal essays for about 12 years. You say early in your book that humans make and remake our stories, abandoning the ones that no longer fit and trying on new ones for size. Would you please talk about that? Oh, yes, I'd love to. I So I have an unfinished PhD in this, so I can talk about it for a long time and be very boring. But I will cut short. There's, there is some really beautiful and interesting uh, research into the history of how language developed and how thought developed, and it developed through storytelling. And when we look at the way that humans actually tell stories in, in everyday life, they do it using lots of techniques that we wouldn't get away with when we're writing fiction. So they use a lot of confabulation, i.e. They, they make stuff up on the spot, like spontaneously to fit the scenario. They engage in narrative repair, whereby they, uh, you know, change the stories the more they tell them to model it to suit. Um, and they conveniently and genuinely forget parts of the story that are inconvenient. And I, you know, you could see that as us being a, a sort of whole, you know, species of liars, but actually I, I think we're just constantly engaged in narrative construction of what we are, what we are on a very basic level. And that's a really optimistic thing to think because we can endlessly remake, you know, like there's no end to stories. There's no fixed story about ourselves. We get to constantly make it and make it again. And that excites me such a lot. It's all about the retelling and the reimagining every single time. Isn't that just wonderful about us? You don't get that if you're a dormouse. <laughs> we were <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's that. That's um, I think a, a great note to to end on. I've got pages and pages of questions that I haven't got to, but, but oh well. Um, well, to so, volume two. <laughs> just to um to to wind up though, and I did warn you that I was going to ask you this, so I'm going to ask mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, I own a bookstore. We like to sell books. Um, can you recommend just a couple of books that you have loved this year? Yeah, I've, you know what, there's been loads of great books this year that I have really fallen in love with. Um, I'm, I've just finished Daniel Evans' um, Office of Historical Corrections, which I just, I enjoyed her writing so much. It's so deceptively simple and just so full of absolute truth about, you know, about living and about how we think and feel. I thought they were wonderful. I, there's a book that I have loved this year that came out in the UK this year that's coming out for you guys next year because I looked it up because I wasn't sure which is um Jenny Diskey's um why I think why can't you do what you're told or can't you just do what you're told or something like that which yeah. is a collection of her essays that she wrote while she was alive because you, you they... 
She's in the book, isn't she? She is, she? yeah. Her, her memoir, Skating to Antarctica, is one of my absolute favourite books of all time. But what's really interesting about this collection, I mean, she's a master of the essay. Yeah. She's years ahead of her time in, her, in the way that she talks about feminism. Like, she would fit right into the kind of contemporary snarky Twitter culture. She's just, like, she was nailing that 30 years ago. But there is an essay in there that the book uh, Skating to Antarctica was based on. And it's actually, I like it even more than the book. It tells the whole story in a much more compact way. Uh, it's a joy. I really, I don't think she's very well known in the States, but I would really recommend her. But I, you know what I read recently as well, which a friend passed on to me, is um, Laurie Gottlieb's Maybe You Should Talk to Somebody. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was totally immersed in that in a way that I absolutely didn't expect to be. Just huh. what a great book. What a wonderful book about therapy culture and what it is to, to change. I, I loved it. Right. Oh, well, those are all good choices. Yes, and, and the Danielle Evans um, we we have, we have on our on our front table, and we've been oh, we've been selling, it. and we're actually hoping that she's going to come to the Unbound Book Festival uh, oh, next year as well. So uh, I'm I'm certainly a fan. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. I'm sorry I've kept you up six minutes past what I said I was going to. I hope that's <laughs> I hope that's okay. I, um, I've got time for a martini before I go to bed now. This is perfect. <laughs> So just to just just to wrap up, uh, we love to put on these events, um, and please help us to be able to continue to do so uh, and buy a book from us. Um, I've been told that apparently your book—I don't know whether you know this—is kind of so popular that you actually can't buy it on our website at the moment because um, our wholesaler has actually sold out. So. Um, wow. so so I think that's a reason to be to celebrate rather than rather than not. Um, so rather than trying to click on that, do just send us an email uh, or, or give us a call tomorrow and we will take care of it. We do actually have several copies in the shop, so we should be able to, to help you out. Um, again, it's mail at skylarkbookshop.com or 573-7776-990. Next up on December the 9th, we welcome Dolores Johnson, <clears throat> excuse me, to talk about her stunning memoir, Say I'm Dead. Uh, and on December the 16th, and we have literally just finalized this today, uh, Wright Thompson will be returning to Skylark to talk about his New York Times best-selling book, Pappy Land. Um, so thank you all so much uh, for uh, being with us. Catherine, thank you for staying up. It's been an absolute joy to talk to you and um, sleep well. Uh, and um, bye everybody, we'll uh, talk to you soon. Thanks.